So people are still coming in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So hi, everyone, and thank you for joining Serac Ventures Office Hours. For those that don't know, Serac Ventures is a seed stage venture capital firm that invests in diverse management teams, building transformative technologies in fintech, future of work, commerce, and other high growth verticals. The overall purpose of Office Hours is really help founders navigate the many challenges of building a high growth business. Last month, we, in our May office hours, we discussed how founders can navigate the current fundraising environment. Uh, next month in July, we'll be talking with Jen Goldman with Bolster to talk about recruiting and hiring uh, for tech companies. So make sure you sign up for that. In this session, we'll be discussing the role of a CEO and how to be an effective leader with three-time CEO and venture partner at Serac Ventures, Chris Sakalakis, and I'll just share a little bit about his background. Chris has been a tech CEO, advisor, and board member for more than 25 years, developing and leading consumer technology businesses at Kiva, Vivino, StubHub, and most recently, Chris was CEO of Kiva. Before that, he was CEO at Vivino, and prior to Vivino, he was an EIR at Benchmark Capital, one of the leading venture capital firms I think ever. And prior to that, Chris served as president of StubHub, the world's largest online ticket marketplace. He was there for eight years and increased the value of tickets sold from 400 million to 3.2 billion while doubling customer satisfaction and increasing brand awareness by over 50%. Chris also led the acquisition of StubHub by eBay and began running StubHub in 2007 when the acquisition was finalized. And lastly, Chris was an eBay marketplace executive from 2003 to 2014 and started his career in technology in 1996. So just a wealth of experience. And before we get to Chris, just want to talk about the format of the meeting today. Uh, I'm going to begin by sort of taking a fireside chat approach with Chris for the first 15 to 20 minutes to ask him specific questions related to being a CEO and an effective leader. Uh, after that, we'll shift to answering questions live, as well as answering questions that were previously submitted prior to this call. And again, if you have a question that you'd like to ask verbally, please raise your virtual hand and we'll make sure to answer your question. Also, you, your questions can be typed in the chat. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so it can be watched later. So without further ado, I'm going to jump in and just tackle the first question. So Chris, what is the role of a CEO? Hi, Kevin. Um, thank you for uh, putting this on and for, for asking the questions. Uh, so the role of a CEO is really simple. It's, it's really two things. One is to set a clear direction or vision for where the company is, is going, how they solve a problem, uh, provide a customer service or, or, or product. That's one. And uh, the second is uh, uh, executing behind that. Uh, and that usually involves building a team of people who can uh, who can actually build that vision and, and get to that that direction. That, those are the basics. Uh, set a clear direction and uh, go after it. Uh, because if all you have is vision, uh, vision without execution is hallucination. So you have to have both, both the vision and the execution. Uh, and that's what a CEO does. That he kind of brings it all, all together. And I want to leave it at a very high level because what I find is most of the information you find out there lists has a long list of things that CEOs need to do, and I'd rather keep it simple. And I think uh, I have a friend who put it this way. Uh, you, people follow a CEO or join a company for the same reason they get on a plane, because they trust that the pilot uh, of the plane is going to get them where they want to go. And they also trust that the plane is going to get them uh, to where they want to go. So they trust both the the person running the plane or running the company and they trust the that the company is equipped to to get uh to get them where they want to go and each employee has his own idea of where they want to go hopefully it's in line with the vision of the uh of the business but those those are the basics awesome and you've ran several companies in, in this case technology companies you've seen a lot of things worked with a lot of people and you currently work with a lot of different founders. In your experience, as you've looked across the ecosystem and experienced this firsthand, what makes a great CEO, in your opinion? 
Well, a great CEO does those two things, the vision and the execution really well. Uh, and they're able to do them both. Um, when I uh, when I was working at Benchmark, uh, Bill Gurley there said, you know, there's if you think of CEOs, you can put them on a two by two matrix in terms of where they stack up and uh, based on their ability to promote and their ability to execute. And great CEOs are both great at promoting and setting a vision and great at executing. And uh, so if you think of uh, the kind of the great CEOs of our time or, or previously, uh, someone like a Steve Jobs, who can set a, a vision of the future where, where they saw computing going and then execute behind, behind that. But he was a great promoter. Uh, there are all these places where you can learn how to, how to present like Steve Jobs. Um, but he, he also got, got it done. Uh, similarly to Elon Musk, who I know is a controversial figure, but if you look at the two companies he's built, or two of the companies he's built, not, not just he hasn't built, he's built more than two, uh, Tesla and, and Starlink, um, uh, sorry, and uh, SpaceX, he's set a very, very bold vision. Uh, and if that's all he had, that wouldn't be enough. He's really been able to execute and, and get behind that. Um, so in the in the roles that I've had, I've spent I've tried to spend a lot of time both on setting a clear vision. At at StubHub, we created a a ten year uh, BHAG big hairy audacious goal to be the source that fans rely on to discover and access uh, and share entertainment experiences worldwide. And based on that, we got people really excited and riled up. And then we built a plan behind that to execute behind that. And that plan included having the right people in place. So. Beyond beyond those two things, beyond being really good at at setting uh, a vision and uh, and being able to execute, um, it's it's really being able to take on any challenge and to overcome those. Uh, sometimes you you start a company and things are going great um, because you just caught the market at this at the right time. You have a product that meets a consumer need, but over time, it's really difficult to sustain that because competitors come in or the market kind of runs out. And the really great uh, companies and the great CEOs can can look around corners and see what's happening, what consumer needs might be, what's happening with competitors or in the industry, and they can build a company that endures by by building more than one product and more than one service and building on top of that. I think the last thing I'd say is to be a great CEO, uh, you have to be authentic uh, because it's this is a really hard job to fake. It's stressful. Um, it takes a lot out of you. And uh, I've found that when you're when you're clear with people, when you when you're yourself, uh, people can see that. And increasingly, people are looking for that. They're not just looking for a figurehead who looks good uh, on a Zoom call, um, but they're looking for someone who can be honest, uh, can be transparent, uh, and can really uh, explain what's happening with the company and and inspire people in in that process. Um, I think it's difficult to do that it's uh, to do both to both be transparent and be inspirational sometimes the the reality of what's happening with the business is one that uh, is a downer for people um, and the the aspirations are always about the future rather than the present but I think if you can build uh, you have to be authentic to build trust and that's the only way people are going to trust you to to build out that vision of the future oh, excellent answer and Thinking about some of those things that you learn as a CEO, I guess for a lot of new CEOs that we encounter at Serac Ventures, and even for experience with in general, there's often probably a nervousness that comes along with leading people and wanting things to go right. What are some of the challenges that new CEOs face? And I guess in your experience, how did you overcome the challenges of leading people and even holding yourself accountable? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, one of them is uh, what I alluded to earlier. There's a long list of expectations that people have about great CEOs. And uh, each employee may have their own list, and that list may not coincide with the next employee. Um, and it's hard to live up to it. Like there's, there's a, we, we live in a hero culture where uh, the CEO is either a hero or a zero. If the company does well, all of the success is ascribed to the CEO. If the company fails, all of it is ascribed to the CEO. Um, and as a result, there's a long list of like great heroes do this, uh, great CEOs do this and that. I remember we had an offsite at, at uh, eBay where they asked people, 
what what makes a great leader and they interviewed people and each person had a list of three or five things and it, the list just kept adding and adding and adding and adding it just kept longer and longer and so i think the one difficulty i've tried to overcome is not to try to check every box on the list but to be clear about what are the things that i'm good at and to double down on those things and the things that were getting in my way uh, and there's a long list of those i can only tackle a few of those at a time so uh in 2000 and uh, and nine, when the recession was hitting, uh, I really, I had some very tough feedback that said I was being too dictatorial with my team, not bringing in their input enough. And so I worked on that, but I worked on one thing because that's all I could handle. Um, and uh, I had the ultimate test of that because later that year I had open heart surgery. I was in the hospital for 10 days. I was gone for two months. So I wasn't at work for two months. And I found that my team could make decisions, set budgets. They did all this great stuff without me. And that the the light bulb went off. Like I didn't need to do everything. Uh, I could I could actually rely on my team to do it. So the first challenge is really not trying to be all things to all people uh, and not trying to do everything. Uh, the other challenge is really, it's a balancing act. Um, I heard uh, when I was, at one point I interviewed at Tesla and one person described Elon Musk's role as, uh, that of the circus performer who spins plates, and many of you may have may not have seen that, but there used to be these performers that have, they would have on sticks little plates and they'd spin them and they'd keep all of them spinning at the same time. And uh, this guy described Elon as the plate spinner, like he would, once he saw a plate start to wobble, he'd run over to that and spin it to make sure it was going. So a lot of troubleshooting. And so you have to troubleshoot, but also think about the long term. You have to uh, keep your board happy but also keep your employees happy. Like there's a lot of balancing and a lot of, uh, and it's really, it's, it's really difficult at times keeping everyone happy. So again, don't, tr don't try to keep everyone happy. Decide who your priorities are. Uh, for me, I always found that if I focused on customers and what made customers happy, that usually was clear to employees and would drive long-term value. So at StubHub, we focused a lot on that promoter score on trying to drive that. And we got very specific customer feedback. We reacted to that uh, by you know, setting more clear expectations, by improving our customer service, by uh, being more clear in terms of our pricing. And we started to see the results of that and that drove the business. So focusing on that one thing allowed me to be successful with those other constituents. And, and I think that's often, often the case here, especially if you focus on your customers. Uh, the, the last piece I'd say about being uh, being a CEO, the challenge of being a CEO is really it's it's a lonely job. Uh, it's lonely at the top. I, I know it's uh, a cliche, but but it's true. Uh, you know, when you have problems with when you're having problems with your board or with your uh, employees, it's hard to go to your employees and complain about it. You don't want your employees to get wound up. You don't want your leadership team to get wound up. Uh, so I think it's important to have a, a peer group you can rely on. Uh, within eBay, I had peers like uh, Josh Silverman, who's now running Etsy, and Audrey Haddad, who's running uh, Turo, uh, they were running different divisions of, of eBay, and so I could go to them and, and talk to them. Uh, another colleague, Jacob Bakra, was running eBay Europe, similarly. Um, outside of eBay, um, I joined uh, YPO, it's the Young Presidents Organization. I'm, I'm no longer a young president, uh, but at the time, <laughs> I was, and so that's really a peer group of 20,000 people around the world, and the the main focus of YPO is being part of a peer group of six to 12 people that meets for four hours every month. And you, you kind of share your experiences, the issues that you're facing, and that group helps you think through that, not by giving advice, but maybe by telling you uh, about a similar situation that they went through and how they got through it. So I'm still part of YPO, uh, YPO Gold. Uh, my kids joke that the G is silent. Um, and that that is a tremendous peer group that that's been super helpful to me uh, in helping me figure things out and getting over the loneliness of of being a CEO. That's actually quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Maybe I'll we'll, let everyone else be the judge. <laughs> maybe we'll pause there just to see if anyone has any questions at this point, or as a comment, or we can move on to some of the questions that have actually come in prior to this call. I'll give it 10 seconds or so if anyone wants to chime in and ask any questions. If none, 
then perhaps we can move to this first question, Chris, that came in around as a CEO, what has been your key to keeping your team motivated during the down slow times of a market? Yeah, when things are bad in the short term, I try to focus on the long term. Um, so the reason people join a company uh, is because they believe in, in the mission or the vision. And that mission could be as simple as serving good food at reasonable prices. Uh, or in the case of my, my dad's electro, electrical construction company, it, it could be uh, you know, building out the electricity in commercial buildings uh, and making sure that they're safe and reliable. Uh, but people join a company for the long-term prospects, the long-term vision, what they can get out of it. Um, so one aspect of that is the vision, the mission for the business. So when things are going tough at StubHub, we kept focusing on that long-term vision to be the source that fans rely on because that was a real motivator. Our, our purpose was serving fans. We really wanted to drive that. And then, and we use customer service or sorry, the net promoter score or, or a measure of customer satisfaction as a way to drive that. And that helped us figure out, okay, if that's a long-term vision, what do we do now to get through it? Um, and there's always that balance of long-term versus short-term, but uh, meaning everyone wants you to focus on long-term, but you have to get through the short-term to get to the long-term. So when you're facing issues in the short-term, it's good to go back to the long-term. What is the vision we're trying to go after and how do we go after it? Um, I think the second aspect is uh, try not to lay blame. Like, like if there's a problem, if you're not meeting your numbers, then act as if it's a mutual problem, a mutual um, problem to solve and seek for a uh, seek uh, sort of help and ideas uh, around it, make it a, an us issue, not a you versus them issue. Sometimes what happens is, you know, you want to hold people accountable. If the company isn't doing well and say your marketing is underperforming, you could, you could go to your marketing person and say, hey, you're underperforming, you need to fix this. But the reality is that if, if if any part of your business isn't doing well, it's not just that department's problem, it's your problem too. So if you approach it as a like, hey, we have this issue, what what can we what can I do to help you? What what else? Um, how can we move forward? What are some ideas? And maybe asking the rest of your team, uh, kind of, you know, this the idea of we're in all of this together uh typically typically helps. You know, Chris, some of the ways you're talking about this seems more like sort of tactical approaches to leadership. Because I would say that asking that question in that format is more of like a leadership tactic than it is because you could say fix the problem versus taking the tactic of this is our problem, let's fix it together. How, how do you think about tactics as a leader? Yeah, I think tactics are important. You know, you're managing people and people are motivated or not motivated depending on what you say and how you treat them. It's pretty simple. Um, so you have to think about how you approach something no one if you if you say to someone look you're not doing the job they get defensive and and or they or you say hey if, if you don't figure this out uh you're not gonna have a job here then then they get scared and people don't perform at their best when they're defensive or scared you want people especially in technology businesses to be creative and to think think about problems um i found it's tough in the in the tough times um there was this sort of demand for accountability. We want, we, we, Chris, we, uh, we want you, Chris, to hold people accountable. And uh, after a little bit of pushing, it seemed like what they meant is they wanted me to hold other people accountable, not them accountable. If I went to someone and say like, yeah, you're not meeting your numbers, here's the accountability. <laughs> they didn't really react well to that. And uh, what I found was accountability is, not so much like punishing people if they don't meet their numbers, it's not letting them fail, which is not to say firing them if they fail, it's actually helping them if they're failing or if they're not meeting their objectives. That's that's what accountability is. It's it's much more of a, again, an us versus you versus, uh, instead of a you versus me uh, paradigm. And that worked uh, a lot better. If I said to people, hey, you're not me, uh, you're not meeting your numbers, uh, that you get one reaction. If I said, guys, we can do better than this. Let's figure it out. You get a different reaction. It's as subtle as that. No, that makes sense. And a question uh, from the chat, how do you balance working high level vision and managing specific goals and people? So 
that's a very, really good question. I think um, high level vision is just the beginning. Think of it as a journey and say you are um, at the ocean and you want to get to the top of a mountain. You can see the mountain. You roughly know where the mountain is, but now you have to figure out how to get there. And the reality is there are lots of way to execute behind that vision or to walk from where you are to that mount to, to that mountain top. Um, so you you know the a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first steps. You may have heard that phrase. Um, so the the balance you have to strike is once you set the high level vision, then you have to think about how do we break this down in terms of steps. What's the first step, or what do we do in this first year of a ten year journey? So that's the first thing. Let's set the objectives for this first year uh, in order to make progress towards that long-term vision. We know it's in the right general direction. We don't know exactly if it's going to get there or not. The, one of the issues that I encountered at StubHub is once we set this long-term vision of the future to be the source that fans rely on to discover access and share entertainment experiences worldwide, people started thinking about that long-term vision and all the features and what that would mean for product and everything else. And the mistake I made was, okay, that's great. We can all agree on what's at the end goal, but what do we start with? And that's really the most important piece because you start at zero, you want to get to 10. You, you need to know step one. Um, so first part of it is break down the high level vision into the first step or maybe the first three steps uh, so that you can have some clarity about how you move forward. Second step is then once you know your first level, uh, your first year goals, break those down uh, in a way that they add up. Uh, so um, I, I like to think about goals mathematically. And uh, a lot of my direct reports have told me that's a really annoying way to think about it. So bear with me. But if you have, let's say, a financial goal, the, the easiest one, their financial goals. So if you have a revenue goal, um, revenue is typically um, number of transactions times the average order per transaction. Um, or in the case of StubHub, it was uh, it was the 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 amount of tickets sold times the commission rate, and the amount of tickets sold was uh, the number of transactions times the the uh, the average transaction amount. Well, number of transactions was really driven by the traffic we drove to the site times the conversion rate, the percentage of uh, traffic that actually made a purchase. So traffic was owned by marketing and conversion was owned by product. And there were underlying factors that uh, that would help or hurt conversion, things like uptime, uh, site speed, and so forth. So the idea is to try to build a pyramid of, if your ultimate goal is, let's say, revenue, break it down into its constituent parts and figure out who owns each part. And then it's, it, it becomes a mathematical equation. You can understand uh, how each component drives the overall goal, but you can also more importantly understand who owns each goal because ownership is important. If you just have a broad goal and no one owns pieces of it, then it doesn't happen. Um, and, and that's the important piece of execution. You have to break down a big goal into its step, into its you know uh, cr chronological steps, and also for it for each chronology, for each year, let's say, or a quarter, uh, ownership of the subcomponents of the goal. And I don't know if that's uh, too vague or not. I, I'm happy to go into more detail. I've spent a lot of time on this. Um, and it's a lot of the work that I've done in the three companies I've run and, and some of the companies that I advise. Great question. Any other questions from uh, participants? If so, feel free to interrupt me. And I guess, given that we see a lot of early stage founders and you work with a lot of them and have over the years, what are some of the mistakes you see that, these early stage tech founders make in regard to doing exactly what you just said, breaking down these larger goals into smaller ones and, uh, and, and not really taking sort of a measured approach, a calculated approach to doing that. Because when I was listening, it sounds like you're describing sort of OKRs and the components of that yeah. and how to really break that down. But what are some of the mistakes you see tech founders make who maybe don't have these leadership skills? Well, one mistake I've seen, and I saw this at one of the companies I ran, I won't say which one, not to embarrass anyone, but the, the previous CEO had created a set of OKRs. Uh, well, the OKRs, OKRs are all bottom up, like each department had their OKRs, but they didn't tie to anything. They, they didn't tie to an overall goal. Um, and even if every department met all their OKRs, they wouldn't, it, it wouldn't help them achieve the overall 
goals of the company. So that was one problem. The other problem was the list of the OKRs were so long that no one would remember it, them. Um, and the second is uh, that they weren't, they, again, uh, I'm sorry, the list was so long and then no one would remember them. So, uh, and the last piece is the, there wasn't accountability or wasn't even tracking. So one of the other companies I ran, they had uh, objectives, they had a revenue target and a budget. The budget wasn't created. It was all top down, created by the CFO, the CEO and the board. Uh, so members of the leadership team had no idea. Uh, they knew what the overall goal was, but they didn't know how it broke down into transactions or transactions per month or anything. Uh, when I got there, I actually showed them the financial model that just said, here's how many transactions we need to drive per month, per quarter. And then I started getting reactions like, there's no way we'll ever get to this. <laughs> but no one had been consulted or told about it. And no one knew that that was their objectives either. So the product team didn't know that this is they needed to meet this conversion level uh, per month. They had no idea. Um, so it was all kind of disconnected. As uh, my boss at eBay, one of my bosses at eBay, Devin Wenig, once said, he goes, sometimes it feels like I have my hands on the steering wheel of this company. And at other times I move the steering wheel, I realize it's not connected to anything. So you have to make sure your, your top level goals are actually connected to lower level goals. In a smaller startup, it's a little easier because you have a smaller team. Uh, but it's also one where I see the CEO try to do too much. They take on like every role. They, they're running product. They're doing fundraising. They're, they're doing the financing. They're doing the analytics. And it's, it's hard to delegate when you have a small team, but you can still delegate even if you have a small team. It's being clear about what are the things that only you as a CEO can do? Typically, fundraising is one of those things. Um, and what are the things that you can have your uh, co-founder or your uh, your early employees do that you don't have to do yourself? You can be you can oversee it at a later point, but you don't have to do it all yourself. Well, that kind of leads to the, the next question in regard to how do you keep your tech and business teams focused on the same things. And I guess maybe that's vague, this question, but it might mean, how do you mm. keep different teams focused directionally going the same? And you may have answered this question in a lot of different ways, but that was- well, I, Yeah, I think it comes down to what are, what's the overall goal of the company? And I don't, I mean, I talked about financial goals uh, because those are the easiest ones to break down. When, when in the three companies that I've run, I've always thought about top level goals in three components. The first is employee engagement. Uh, so how engaged are your employees? How likely are they to uh, do, do the work, not just do the work they're assigned, but to go above and beyond. Uh, the second is customer satisfaction, usually measured with net promoter score. And the third is financial results. And one flows from the other. So employee engagement, if your employees are engaged, they create great, great products, they offer great service. Uh, that drives customer satisfaction. If your customers are satisfied, they will come back, they will keep doing business with you and they'll tell the, their friends and that drives uh, great financial results. Um, sometimes what I see between tech and business teams is that they have different goals that aren't aligned and they don't lead up to anything. So again, uh, in, the, in the StubHub example, marketing, ran, marketing was responsible for driving traffic to the site and product uh, technology was responsible for converting that traffic into sales. Um, so there's a kind of, each one had their own set of goals, but again, they, once those, uh, those kind of met up to get the overall, uh, sales goal or the number of transaction goal. And so I would always have my directs own the part of their bonus would be tied to the overall goals of the company, which again, were in three categories so I didn't have 18 goals for the company. Um, and then each department head would own uh, the goal, the goal for their department as well. And so their their bonus was based on how well the overall goal for, uh, goals for the company were met, and then how the goals for that specific department were met. And and that also became a mathematical mathematical equation. Um, your bonus is equal to the target amount times uh, some percentage, uh, the percentage that you you achieved of your personal goals and the percentage you achieved of the company goals. No, that's all said. And again, I'll pause there to see if anyone else has any questions. Again, raise your hand or throw them in the chat or I can move on to the next question. 
uh, which just came in. How do you build a company culture? It's a really good question because it seems like it's easier to create culture at the onset of a company than it is to change it into something else uh, after a company's yeah. established. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, company culture is really important. I think every company has a culture, whether they're intentional or not about it. Uh, that's the first lesson. So you can either let it happen the way that it happens, or you can be intentional about it. And I think that's the point of the question. Um, when I joined StubHub, everyone at eBay is like, so what's the culture like? What's a culture like at StubHub? Because we were in different offices. It was, uh, you know, it was a startup that had just been acquired. And I could never really answer that question. I didn't even know what company culture is. So I'll start by saying that company culture is the way things get done around here is sort of the, the, the broad way of saying it. The other way of saying it is um, you, if you go against the company culture, you get punished somehow. And if you go, uh, if you work with the company culture or you're part of it, you get rewarded. So if there, you have a company culture that doesn't like dissent and people who uh, make, uh, who sort of raise criticism get fired, it's clear that that's part of the culture as an example. So um, so getting back to the question, uh, I think you build a culture first by being clear about um, the vision, where you want the business to go, what you want the business to be. Um, again, at StubHub, it was to be the source that fans rely on to discover, access, and share entertain entertainment experiences worldwide. From that, we said, look, our purpose is to serve fans because we want to be the the resource fans rely on. So we really focus on fans and that's different than other ticketing companies like say Ticketmaster, whose main customer is either a venue or a sports team. Um, so our our main customer was the fan. And then we said, okay, what are the what are the things that are that are our values, the things that if violated will get you fired uh, or will get will get people deeply upset. Uh, and so those values tend to come from the founder. There are things that are important to you uh, as the founder or as the CEO of the company. Uh, so typically cultures reflect the, the person or persons running the company. Uh, that's that's the first thing. So be I think as if you're starting a company and building a culture, you need to be clear about what's important to you. What are the values that you really care about? And sometimes it's difficult to find that. I think one way to find it, again, I, I'm starting to talk about it in the negative, but if your values get violated, you get really upset. So if someone is late to a meeting, let's say, and you get really upset about that, one of your values is punctuality, or maybe it's mutual respect. Um, if someone is um, presenting information to you and the data is misleading, uh, then maybe honesty is one of your values or uh, being data-driven is one of your values. So think about um, what are the things that are important to you that if they're violated, um, it, it's something that would be a fireable offense at your company. Um, or what are the things that are deeply motivating to you? I got into this business because um, I heard a lot of that in the music industry. I got into this business, business because, of the mu uh, of, of, because of my love of music. Um, what are the things that are really important? Is it about learning? Uh, is it about honesty? Is it about being data-driven? Is it about having super happy customers? Uh, um, those are the things that define a culture. And if you do it right, then when people are asked, uh, violating the values around here gets you in trouble or um, following the values around here gets you promoted and pe people say 100% agree, then you'll know you'll have a very clear culture. But culture is really driven by values, what's important uh, to the business and what's important to, uh, typically to the founders. So I hope that helps. Any other questions? Chris, one of the things that I think about with companies is the founder, the right person to grow, grow this company from X to 3X or 4X or 5X, ideally 10X. To me, that is about letting go and something you talked about earlier. But what have you seen as far as like the traits of leadership that found some founders have that others either don't have or, or won't adopt that prevent them from taking their company from ground zero 
to the next SpaceX or whatever. Just curious about how what you've seen and how new leaders should be thinking about scaling their companies. Um, I think the main obstacle to a founder becoming the long-term leader is their ability or willingness to learn. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at someone like, say, <clears throat> Mark Zuckerberg, and again, I know he's a controversial figure, but he has been successful in going, building a company from zero to a publicly traded and hugely um, important and, um, and valued company. Um, and part of the skill that he skills that he talks about is learning and learning every day. And every, uh, every year he, ha he sets out some new skill to learn. One year is learning uh, Mandarin. Um, so they're not, they're not small things. Uh, so uh, that's one aspect. It's being able to learn and then being able to, and, and part of being able to learn is being able to bring in people who uh, lack, who have the skills that you lack and then letting them do their job and teach you. Um, so when I when I hire a leadership team, I try to find someone who's expert in their field, uh, who's going to be able to run whatever department they're going to run, but someone who's going to be able to come to do things that I can't do. Because as a CEO, I'm a kind of jack of all trades and a master of none. So I'm trying to find people who, who are smarter than me, who know more than I do, and who, who will push my thinking, especially in their area of expertise, and who will also be part of the strategic discussion of where the company is going. Uh, so not just running their department, but being part of the leadership uh, of the team. So what I've seen in, um, in, in, in founders that don't scale, um, and I, I want to be clear that it's really difficult being a founder. It's very hard to start a business from nothing and get it to a place where it's successful. I haven't done that. What I've done is been the second CEO of a company. I've replaced two founding CEOs uh, and I have a deep level of respect for them. Uh, but in in, a, in those instances, if I think back, in one case, it was uh, someone who was super, super smart and strategic, but didn't like managing people. And the bigger an organization gets, the more people there are, to some extent, the more bureaucratic it gets. And you have to be really good about people and organizing people and thinking about people. Uh, my first boss, well, not my one of my bosses at, at eBay, Bill Cobb, told me uh, as I was going to StubHub, he goes, look, as a general manager of a larger company, you're going to be spending all your time with HR and finance. HR in terms of managing people and finance, making sure that the, the numbers are lined up. And for someone who starts as a kind of product visionary and builds a company, that doesn't sound really exciting. <laughs> uh, it, and it, it's not. It's not as exciting as building product. And some people are unwilling to do that. And the response to that is, okay, I'll hire a COO uh, in the way that Mark hired uh, Sheryl Sandberg at, at Facebook, uh, now Meta. Um, that's one response. Uh, and the other response is like, look, I don't, I don't want to do this. Like this has gotten to a point where this business is, is so big that it, it's not the same business it was. It's not any fun anymore to run. And so I want to go off and do something else. And being uh, uh, being knowledgeable that that's what's happening is is a really good like having that self knowledge and awareness that maybe this isn't the right thing for me personally I'm not enjoying it any, anymore uh, is another aspect um, to the to the job. Uh, but really, it's in order to scale, you need to learn new uh, new skills. Uh, there's a book um, that I was given uh, that I actually read about leadership called "What What Got You Here Won't Get You There." which is really about going from managing a small team to managing a, um, a group of uh, people managers and, and, and scaling up your ability to manage people. Uh, and it really requires a shift, a shift in your thinking and, and a building of a new skill set. And some people are willing to do that uh, and, and, while others are not. And, and some people are you know, not able to do it. I'm just putting that book in the chat because I think that's a good one. Won't what got you here won't get you there. Yeah, I, I think that's right. So we have reached the portion of the meeting where it's really ask Chris anything um, at this point. Again, there were a number, a lot of questions that came in prior to this uh, meeting. 
again, I can continue to go through those, but I really think the true value add for, oh, you're just going. I have a question, Kevin. Okay, go ahead. And it's kind of a, a continuation of your conversation, the question about a CEO who maybe can't scale um, and a little bit broader aspect um, as a former CEO and leader, and then now on kind of the consulting side, and that's kind of the position I'm in. How do you how do you see the need for when you need to bring in like third party or outsiders or maybe even interim uh, C suite members or, or even a fractional CEO, et cetera, in order to kind of provide what the company needs at the time? And and is it more focused on short term and kind of getting over gaps, or is it something that needs to be kind of rolled into the long term? How do, how do you balance all of those decision making when you're the person at the top who Maybe it doesn't feel like you have what you need internally. Is it higher, temporary? Is it third party, et cetera? Uh, and this is, you're the CEO, but you're looking to bring in people uh, with a new skill sets. Actually, I'm a CEO that I'm also consultant and I'm being asked a little bit to do some fractional CEO and mm. that type of thing. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out the exact right approach. I see. Um, yeah, the fractional CEO job uh, is really hard. I did one interim CEO gig and I, it was four months of pain um, because you're, you're, you don't have full authority, uh, but you not only have the CEO title. And uh, the other issue typically is that no company that's doing well does a CEO switch. So in, in, in my instances, you go into a situation that needs cleanup, a lot of fixing. And so <clears throat> I think you have to be clear, like, first of all, who's hiring you and what is the objective of the interim job? Is it just keep the seat warm while we find someone? Or is it we have a lot of issues that need to be fixed before the next CEO comes in? Uh, the second is what authority do you really have? Like how much can you change without having to go back to the board? Um, can you change out people, you know, being clear about that up front will, uh, will make you more successful and also m maybe help you decide, do I really want to do this or not? Because <laughs> if you have, if every decision has to be run by someone, um, uh, you know, you're, you're more a fractional babysitter than you are a fractional CEO. Um, so I think those are some of the decisions that go into it. I think the third is like, just how much can you get done in the time that you have realistically? Um, Sometimes things are a little too far gone uh, for you to do anything. Uh, what I've found in the Valley is because investors want to be founder friendly, they wait a really long time before they move a CEO out, especially in the consumer business. Um, and so the question is, okay, is this fixable or not? And if so, how long will it take? Um, and what I've found in these situations is whoever brings you in wants you to move super quickly but they don't necessarily want to give you the tools that allow you to move super quickly. So having, <laughs> having that conversation up front before you get into it is probably helpful. Right. Like as an example, sense. the company I ran had a, had a CTO who quickly became clear that he shouldn't be there, but, but they wouldn't allow me to fire the guy uh, because I had to line up all these issues uh, beforehand. And that made it more, much more painful than, than before. No, that's a great question, Kyle. Um, anyone else? Any other questions for Chris? Or we can continue with some of these other questions. And Chris, there were a couple of questions about uh, intellectual property and just technology mm -hmm. and how that sort of impacts what you do uh, as a as a leader and. I guess the, the exact question is, how does the ability to secure IP impact a company? What are your thoughts on the value of that sort of asset, intangible asset? Is that something that CEOs are thinking about or should be? And how has this changed over the last 10 years, especially since technology seems to so ubiquitous in everything that we do? Yeah, I think the myth is that if you have a great set of patents, you're protected and you can build a great business. And the reality is 
at least as I've seen it, um, patents allow you to have a legal monopoly, but you have to you have to protect that. And so if someone violates your patent, you have to sue them in order to protect the patent. And a patent lawsuit costs millions of dollars. It also costs a bit of money to have a patent as well. So it's great to have proprietary technology, but it's really your ability to exploit that technology that matters as opposed to the fact that you have a patent around it. Um, the way that um, Bill Gurley talked about it is patents would be great if the market actually respected them, uh, but it, they, they don't, uh, unfortunately. Um, so I find that people with a technological background really love patents and, and um, you know, if you're coming out of a PhD program uh, or you're, you're really technology heavy, and I haven't worked at technology heavy companies, then everyone has a great deal of respect for patents. But the reality is the, the market doesn't or, or is not, not as much as maybe they should. Um, so I think it's great to have proprietary technology to protect it somewhat, but that only, that doesn't, that's not enough. And I don't think it's even necessary, um, but it's certainly not sufficient uh, for you to have a successful company. You have to really be able to um, to take that technology and apply it uh, quickly. What tends to happen in larger companies is that patents are very helpful as a defensive mechanism. So this is something that isn't particularly obvious. So at, at eBay, we had a, an inventors club. So if you came up with an idea for something, and again, patents are, are ideas. They're not necessarily, they don't have to be implemented. I think they have to be implemented in order to be enforced, but you can you can issue you can ask uh, for a patent around an idea before you implement it. As an example, so company uh, eBay had you know the IP group within legal, the intellectual property group would ask people if they had ideas uh, for patent submissions, and they would submit them, and they would spend the thousands of dollars because eBay had all that money to spend, and you would get a jacket or something like a leather jacket that was there was a reward for it. But all those patents allowed eBay to use them in a countersuit if they got sued for a patent. So they're like, oh yeah, we're violating your patent, you're violating one of ours. And that's why they have these kind of patent farms and companies like eBay and Google are part of a consortium uh, that holds a bunch of patents for the defense of patent lawsuits. It's completely perverse, it's bizarre, uh, but that's how they're mostly used in technology. I haven't seen a startup uh, be successful because they have a patent. I mean, you, you've seen maybe, I think Roku had a patent lawsuit and um, Sonos uh, against Google, but Sonos was already a pretty big company before they were able to prosecute uh, that, that patent. Um, it, it's not something that as a startup, you're going to be able to spend a lot of money on, maybe on creating the patent, but certainly not on, on, on its uh, defense. Excellent point. That's interesting insight. Um, so it's a good thing to have down the road, uh, but don't don't count on it saving saving your lunch in the early years of the business. So we have about ten minutes left in this meeting. I'm not going to go through any more of these questions because there were like twenty of them. Um, I guess this will be the sort of last call for questions from uh, people who are on this call. Otherwise, we can wrap there unless there are any other questions. But I think this has been great, Chris, seeing hearing your insight on leadership and what you've done over your career in technology. And again, anyone, feel free to reach out to any of us at Serac about things like this. You know, the overall objective is to add value to you and to help your company grow and to help you be a better leader a better uh, and better founder and we want to help you do that uh so i guess i'll leave it there unless we have any other questions if not then i will bid everyone adieu excellent well thank you everybody for attending this office hours and sign up for next month july 20th we're going to be talking about recruiting and hiring and finding talent for your startup so Thank you all for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone, for your time.